Welcome back to the Lab Rat Lab. Now in this episode, I want to give you some insights on the work energy theorem. Now as usual, I'm going to talk a little bit about physics, I'm going to do a little bit of math, and then we'll do an experiment to see if we can prove that the work energy theorem is valid. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's start off with a quick refresher on mechanical work and mechanical energy. Now mechanical work is performed when a force acts over a distance, or W is equal to F times D. And the units of mechanical work are newton meters or foot pounds. Now the force and distance can be plotted on a graph. The mechanical work is the area under the force distance curve. You'll see the graphs here below have the vertical axis of force in newtons and the horizontal axis distance in meters. So if I take the area, that's force times distance or newtons times meters. So you see how the uh, newton meter units come out for work. Now for simple force distance curves, as depicted above, simple geometry can be used to calculate the area of the curve. You see the left-hand graph is a rectangle, and the right-hand graph is a simple triangle. However, for more complex force distance curves, calculus may have to be applied. While mechanical work is fairly easy to comprehend, it's a force acting over some distance, mechanical energy is a little more difficult to mentally visualize. Now there are two commonly known forms of mechanical energy. One is gravitational potential energy, and the other being kinetic energy. A gravitational potential energy, PE, is equal to mgh, is known as the energy of position. Now, in the example at the right, the gravity force acting on a brick held at a height of five feet above the floor is doing no work while the brick is suspended at five feet because it is not moving. And we know that W is equal to force times distance, and if the distance moved is zero, the work is zero. But this brick has a potential to do work if it is released. As such, it has energy or the ability to do work. Now, when dropped, the gravitational force, which is F, which is equal to mg, which is equal to weight, on the brick can start to perform work because the brick and the weight force is free to move. In this case, the force is being applied over the fall distance, and we know that work is equal to force times distance. Kinetic energy, Ke is equal to one half mass times velocity squared, is known as the energy of motion. Now, if a brick is moving at a constant velocity, it is by definition not being accelerated. If it is not being accelerated, the sum of the forces, for example, pulling or pushing force, friction force, or drag force, acting on the brick must be zero. This means the net force is equal to zero. This is Newton's second law in action. Now, since work is a force acting over distance, while the moving brick results in a distance being covered over time, the lack of a net force means no work is done. However, if the moving brick collides with another object, it will generally slow down. This means the brick will have a negative acceleration, also known as a deceleration. If there's an acceleration, a net force must exist. While the distance over which this force acts may be short, it's occurring over a finite distance. And as such, the force is acting over a distance and thus work is done. Hence, kinetic energy has the ability to do work. The amount of work done by the brick is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the brick as a result of the collision. Now, if the brick is being accelerated, by definition, it must have a force acting on it. Again, F equals MA. As such, that force is acting over some distance, and as a result, there's an energy in the system, and it's the energy of motion. Now, if you examine the equations for gravitational potential energy, and kinetic energy, you'll notice that the units come out to be newton meters or foot pounds. So this means that the units for work are the same as the units for mechanical energy. So this means the two must be related in some manner. Now, the definition of energy is actually the ability to do work. And this is why it can be difficult to envision. After all, how does one envision the ability to do something? Now, the idea of ability in the definition of energy implies that work is stored in an object in some manner. In fact, the term energy comes from Greek meaning work within. Now, mechanical work can be related to mechanical energy via the work energy theorem. So now, let's derive the equation for the work energy theorem. First of all, we know that work is equal to force times distance, or F times X. We also know from Newton's second law that F is equal to MA. Now, if we combine those two equations, we see that work is equal to ma times x. Now, acceleration is actually a change in velocity divided by time. V sub zero is the object's initial speed at t equals zero, 
And V sub t is the object speed at some time t. So we can use this equation to calculate the acceleration of the object. We also know that distance is the average velocity times time. And if we take a look at the units of these equations, we see that they work out into acceleration and units of distance. Now, if we substitute in the equations for acceleration and distance into the work equation, we get the following. If we apply some basic algebra to that equation, we ultimately see that work is equal to 1 half m v sub t squared minus 1 half m v sub zero squared. We know that the equation 1 half m v squared is the equation for kinetic energy. And we should notice that the right-hand side of the new work equation represents the change in kinetic energy. So if we define the initial kinetic energy as Ke sub zero, and the kinetic energy at some later time t as Ke sub one, we can come up with a shorthand version for the work energy theorem equation, where work is equal to Ke sub one minus Ke sub zero. Now the work energy theorem deals with unbalanced forces that result in acceleration being applied to an object. We should notice that if there's no change in velocity, the acceleration is zero, or velocity sub one is equal to velocity sub zero, there is no work done on the object. Now, the work energy theorem can allow us to calculate the velocity change experienced by an object if we know how much work is done on that object. Now, the best way to explain this is through an experiment. This allows us to see that the theory does predict what will happen in reality. Here's a simple animation of the experiment we'll be conducting. We have a rolling cart. And it's going to be propelled by a stretch rubber band. And this rubber band and block system acts a lot like a slingshot. When the retention force is released, the cart will start moving to the right. This ultrasonic motion sensor will be used to measure the velocity, acceleration, and displacement of the cart as it moves. Now, when the rubber band is fully stretched, it'll have a maximum spring force. And we're going to start off with a cart at zero velocity. Now the work done by the rubber band will be used to calculate the theoretical velocity of the cart when the rubber band is fully relaxed, where F is equal to zero. When I let go of the stinger and release the retention force, the rubber band is free to push the cart towards the right. Again, notice that the spring force is maximum just as I release it, and the cart velocity is zero. However, as the cart begins to move, the rubber band begins to relax, and thus the spring force decreases. However, since there's still a positive force acting on the cart, you notice the cart velocity continues to increase, or it continues to accelerate. Again, the rubber band relaxes a little bit more, the spring force drops down, but the cart continues to speed up. Now, precisely when the rubber band is fully relaxed, the spring force becomes zero, and the acceleration on the cart also becomes zero, and it should achieve a constant velocity. However, over time, friction will reduce the velocity of the cart. So to make a valid experiment, we need to measure the velocity of the cart just as the spring force becomes zero. We'll use that velocity in our work energy theorem calculations. Here's my experimental cart. It's simply a four-wheeled system. It's got a wood stinger that passes through a hole in my rubber band spring plate, and that propels the cart down the track. And this cart weighs approximately 400 grams, or 0.4 kilograms. Now here's my rubber band spring system. As you can see, the cart's stinger passes through a hole in the spring plate. And that stinger makes contact with the rubber band. And as I push the cart back, it stretches the rubber band, applying greater and greater force to the cart. And if I release the cart, it goes zipping down the track. I'm using this ultrasonic motion detector to determine the position of the cart as a function of time. That data is then used to determine the cart's acceleration and velocity. Now what I want to do is measure the velocity of the cart just as the stinger leaves the spring block. That's when the force becomes zero and the velocity should be at its maximum. Now let's make some force measurements on the rubber band spring system. I have no stretch in the spring, so I have zero force. There's two centimeters, four centimeters, six centimeters, eight centimeters, and 10 centimeters. Here's the data I collected on the stretched rubber band. You notice when there was zero stretch distance, there was zero newtons of force being generated. However, when I stretched rubber band all the way up to 0 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters, rubber band produced 5.25 newtons of force.
Now here's the same data put on a force versus stretch distance graph. Let's see the data is not quite linear. However, it's close enough that I can approximate the area under the curve using a simple right triangle. Now recall that the area under the force versus distance curve is the work being done by the rubber band. So if I calculate the area of one half base time height, I get area is equal to 0 0.25 Newton meters. Again, that's the work being produced by the rubber band on the cart. Now I'll calculate the theoretical velocity of the cart. Here's my work energy equation. And we already calculated the area in the curve, which is the work of the rubber band on the cart of 0 0.25 Newton meters. Again, here's the equation for kinetic energy. Now, since the cart started from a resting position, the initial kinetic energy, Ke0, is zero. As such, the work energy equation becomes work is equal to Ke sub one. Again, here's the work equation. Now I can apply some algebra and calculate the velocity of the cart due to the work being applied and the cart's mass. Put in my numbers, and I see that the theoretical velocity of the cart, just as it leaves the spring system, is 1.12 meters per second. Well, now that I've got some background on the physics, and I've collected some data on my rubber band spring system, it's time to start the experiment. Here's test one. I'm going to stretch the rubber band to 10 centimeters. Three, two, one, release. Now, we'll repeat the experiment four more times so I can get a reasonable average for the maximum velocity of the cart. Test two, three, two, one, zero. Test three. Test four. And finally, test number five. Now we're going to take a look at the five data sets and see what kind of average velocity we have. Here's the data I collected from the five CART trials. Here's the velocities that were measured by the ultrasonic motion detector. I've calculated an average velocity of 1.05 meters per second. Now here's the theoretical data compared to the measured data. And the theoretical was 1.12 meters per second. And the measured average was 1.05 meters per second. The variation between the theoretical result and the experimental result is about 5%. Now, considering the crudity of the experimental setup, the wooden cart, wooden track, rubber band spring, and resolution of the digital scale and motion detector, the results can be considered quite reasonable. Now let's take a quick look at an alternate experimental approach to see if we can figure out if frictions have an effect on this experiment. Here's an alternate experimental approach to reduce friction in the system. What I have is a uh, plate that's used for a reflector for my motion detector and attached to a stinger, which again pushes on the spring. And here's a pendulum string, which allows the bob to move freely without friction. Now, as before, I pull the uh, stinger back, applying force to the stinger. When I release it, the bob is free to move without friction. Now, as before, I make several trials to collect data for the pendulum system. Test two. Test three. Test four. And finally, test five. Now we can take a look at the five data sets and see what kind of average velocity we got. Here's the results from the pendulum test. Here are the velocities that were measured by the motion detector. And the average is 1.62 meters per second. Now this value is different than that from the cart because I pulled the rubber band back to only six centimeters for this test. And of course the uh, system mass was different as well. Now I did the theoretical calculation and the velocity should have come out to be 1.7 meters per second but the measured velocity was 1.62. Now this represents a 5% error, which is the same as the cart tests. Now, since the percent error for both experiments was on the order of 5%, that kind of tells me that friction was not having a big effect on my experimental results. So I had to look elsewhere. And what I found was the resolution of my force measuring device and my motion detector could give me that 5% error. So there it is. I think that little experiment demonstrates that the work done on an object is related to its change in kinetic energy. Now I hope you've gained some insights on the work energy theorem and I can't wait to see you next time at LabRat Scientific.